So let us begin. And today what we'll do is just review and you know kind of get our minds back wrapped around what we had been thinking about last semester and to talk a little bit about where we're headed this semester, what some of the goals are for the semester. So as we have discussed many times now, the subject of quantum optics is really at its heart about coherence. And what we mean by co what I mean by coherence is a system is, exhibits coherence means that uh, coherence if it has the capacity to exhibit interference. Now, of course, interference is a notion that comes from classical physics. And what we mean when we talk about interference, we typically are talking about waves. All right? That's where the notion of interference comes from. Uh, and in classical physics, wave interference is a natural um, consequence of linearity. Meaning that if we had that because waves are solutions to linear differential equations, we have the principle of superposition. That if we have any two solutions to a wave equation, then their linear combination is also a solution. And because of that, we have the, the property of interference. Okay? Now, of course, when we go into the quantum domain, then what we're talking about when we talk about quantum coherence is not necessarily the interference between physical waves, but we're talking about interference of processes. It's a much more abstract notion of interference. And of course, there is a a way in which, because there is, when we're talking about quantum optics, and because there are physical quantities that are effectively waves that are described within the classical description, the electromagnetic waves. And then at the same time, we're talking about the interference at the quantum level things get a little bit confusing here. Well, what are the processes? Are the waves that we're talking about that represent those processes in the quantum world the same thing as those classical waves, those cl classical electromagnetic waves? And that was one of the subjects that we addressed to some degree last semester. In particular, uh, if we're talking about um, uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, processes, there is a direct analogy, of course, we have the problem of those, those processes are typically associated with quanta or particles. 
So there is an important aspect of this which has to do with wave particle duality. Um, now, things, there are aspects of this kind of interference of processes which had a direct classical analogy in terms of what we would think about as classical wave interference. And there were aspects of that kind of interference which had no classical analog whatsoever. And in particular, when we thought about multi-quanta processes, then we typically have typically no classical analog. So the things get really interesting for us when we're not thinking about the interference kind of photon by photon, or one individual photon, but when we had collections of multiple photons that whose collective behavior was kind of irreducibly collective and couldn't be taken particle by particle. And that will lead us to something we're going to talk in much more detail this semester, which we only kind of cursorily discussed last semester. And that's the important subject of entanglement. That's something we really, it's not a word we really used very much last semester but we'll use a lot more this semester as we try to really develop more un deeper understanding about how multi-quantic coherent phenomena are different from the sort of particle by particle. Uh, in fact, this marriage between understanding multi-quantic coherent phenomena and entanglement, of course, when we talk about multi Quanta. This is another word for many body, right? Uh, many body physics has now uh, is now beginning to be more deeply analyzed from the perspective of its uh, entanglement properties and how that relates to things like the order parameter. Uh, of uh, a condensed matter system. So there is, there are relations, some of the kinds of things like Hanbury Brown twists that we talked about and we'll review again today are being uh, revisited in the context of more traditional uh, condensed matter physics. Um, right. Now, of course, once we start thinking about this kind of uh, many-body or multi-quanta type quantum coherent phenomena entanglement, then, well, as we all know, such systems tend to be uh, fairly delicate. And it's quite difficult to uh, have systems that can exhibit multi-quanta or many-body quantum coherent phenomena beyond sort of a few degrees of freedom. And that's going to lead us to the whole problem that's sort of on the flip side of coherence that will be the core of the subject this semester, really, which is the problem of decoherence. So decoherence is what decoherence means is the loss of quantum coherence. So the question, if coherence is the capacity for a system to exhibit interference, decoherence is the process by which that capacity is lost. And what we have understood much better, I'd say, than 
was perhaps explicitly discussed in the early days of quantum mechanics is how this process of decoherence is contained within quantum mechanics itself. It's not magical. It's not something we have to throw up our hands and say, and then the system loses its ability to exhibit uh, interference. It's something that happens within the laws of quantum mechanics itself. And it happens when we have the kind of system when we talk about not a closed quantum system, but this is intimately related to the problem of what we call open quantum systems. <clears throat> Meaning that any quantum system is open to interaction with the environment. What in thermodynamics is called the reservoir or the bag, okay? And as we know, the macroscopic mechanical world typically follows somewhat different dynamical laws than isolated microscopic systems, right? We have reversible motion in microscopic Hamiltonian dynamics, but we have irreversible dissipative thermodynamics due to that kind of macroscopic coupling. Um, so there's no surprise at some level that when we go from the microscopic to the macroscopic, those same principles apply in the quantum world as, as well. Um, what is going to be uh, interesting to us beyond just the notions of, of equilibration and uh, you know reaching of thermodynamic distributions of energy uh, or entropy is what that means about quantum coherence how quantum coherence and the the loss of quantum coherence is the same or different than thermodynamic equilibration. What is it? Um, so that's going to be a, a big topic. We, we kind of touched on this last semester. We've seen some of this. We talked about the spontaneous decay of uh, two-level atom going from excited state decay to down a, a, a ground state. And if we had a superposition of excited ground, that would cause a decoherence of that superposition, right? So we want to understand that at a deeper level. Now, there is one other important relation here that's going to be uh, a, a, a key ingredient of our semester. And that is the relationship between decoherence and measurement. Now, measurement, as we all know in quantum mechanics, is you know a, a bag of worms, uh, and you know to this day remains a bit of a mystery and a question mark of what exactly we're talking about. Um, but there is a way in which we can try to formalize the theory of measurement within quantum mechanics itself without having a meta theory on top of it. And we want to understand the relationship between measurement and decoherence. Obviously, when we say we've done a measurement and we have an outcome where previously there was a coherence, say, of possibility of interference between different alternatives, after the measurement, that coherence is gone. So there's some intimate relationship between these problems. Exactly what that relationship is is something we need to, to probe a little bit more deeply. Okay. So these are the kind of the core subjects that we're going uh, to try to address this semester. And yet one more. And that is, as many of you know, and many of you are working on and interested in, you know, in recent decades, and we've come to understand that 
um, these interesting and sometimes strange properties of quantum mechanics aren't just oddities or you know, just philosophical questions about the nature of the universe, which maybe just is the wrong word. That in itself is, is maybe what it's all about, why we're interested in it. Um, but we've come to understand that, you know, not there, they're not just fun, but there's profit to be made. Uh, and that is um, that the, these properties of entanglement and coherence, etc., open the door to processing information in ways that devices that operate under the laws of classical physics are just not capable of, just fundamentally incapable of. And, you know, because uh, quantum optics has been the form in which both the theoretical questions about the foundations of quantum mechanics were really put to the test most deeply. And with the experimental tools developed in order to manipulate individual quanta and measure them with extreme precision, it was quantum optics where quantum information science uh, protocols were first done. And it's because they were online, ready to go, you know, when, after Shor's algorithm was uh, released to the world in 1994, like two months later, Sirach and Zoller wrote their paper on how to make a uh, quantum computer in an ion trap. And, you know, a few months later, uh, you know, Chris Monroe, who will be giving our colloquium uh, this Friday, did the first experiment to tell uh, demonstrate quantum logic uh, in, 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 a, in an ion trap. Uh, what's that? Thursday or Friday? Uh, he's giving both the secret seminar on Thursday and the colloquium on Friday. Uh, he's giving two talks. Um, uh, you know, the, the secret seminar will be a bit more um, specialized uh, as, as, as always. Um, so, uh, that's why most of us who were trained as quantum opticians, as I was in the you know late '80s, early '90s, uh, you know, quickly retooled ourselves into quantum information scientists because that's what we were thinking about at the time. And so, what we're going to attempt to do in this class, and hopefully we'll have enough time to do it, uh, is to take uh, the general concepts and tools that we develop uh, in, um, in the course and look at their applications to different protocols in quantum information like quantum communications, quantum computation, and quantum sensing and metrology. And that's, see, we're ambitious. We'll see how far we get in any of that. But if we don't get there, you will, because you'll all have written your papers about that, and we'll have our mini journal, and we'll read all about it afterwards. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so let's review some of these concepts a little bit. Firstly, let's remind ourselves about coherence. So, um, when we think about this, we might think about, as we've talked about it, uh, if we think about this classically, we can think about a classical interferometer. And in its simplest uh, instantiation, we might think about a two-path interferometer, like our favorite picture of the Mach Zender interferometer, with two mirrors and a beam splitter on each end here. And we have some 
electric field in over here and some electric field out. And as we've done before, we just take one polarization state, forget about the vector nature of the field for the moment. And uh, this electric field is related to the input electric field at the retarded times, depending on the two paths. So we have this principle of zero position, where we have two paths, one path of length L1, another path of length L2. And uh, if we look at the output intensity, well, really these should be the complex amplitudes of each of those fields. And our intensity up to factors that we don't care about is related to the square of the field, which we average. And as we've discussed before, we can think about these fields as, for the moment, classically stochastic variables. And under the conditions of um, stationary statistics, we discussed last semester, this, if these are 50-50 beam splitters, then this was equal to one half uh, the input intensity plus the correlation function between the input field at time tau and another time, the initial time, where tau is L2 minus L1 over C. Yeah, I should have a real part that's what I'm missing. So, what, did it mean, what does it mean for this system to exhibit coherence? What it means is that there is a well-defined correlation between the field at two different times. This is an example of temporal coherence. This was our autocorrelation function between the field and itself at two different times. And if we look at the correlation of the field coming out of this light bulb, there's only a finite coherence time, as we've discussed, due to, for example, the collisions between the oscillators in this beautiful fluorescence light bulb. Um, so there's a finite coherence time between them. Okay? Now, that coherence in the quantum world was we described as two different processes associated with these quanta. In one process, I might have the photon going, transmitted through the beam splitter, bouncing off the mirror, and, and bouncing off the beam splitter here, and going to this detector on this side. All right, there's another mirror here, but it, it went along that path. And then there's another process which is completely indistinguishable from that one in which the photon bounces off the first beam splitter, then bounces off this mirror, and then is transmitted through these, this beam splitter, and then hits the detector. Those two processes, to the degree to which they are indistinguishable, in which I can't tell whether process one, <coughs> process A, or process B happened. So here's the mirror over here. Means that I have to add the amplitudes, which are described by 
wave amplitude psi 1 and psi 2, and this total wave amplitude for the detection is the sum of the two, and the probability is related to psi squared, which will have a cross term. Okay? And therefore, quantum interference. And the degree to which we see those that interference is the degree to which these things are indistinguishable. Okay? Now, what we will show, and we will discuss in some great detail in the middle of the semester, is how <coughs> environmental perturbations <coughs> can cause these two paths to become distinguishable. And if they are distinguishable, they don't interfere. So that should come out of quantum theory. And that is going to involve entanglement of the photons with other degrees of freedom. When we don't look at those other degrees of freedom, then we lose the coherence. And therefore, the system decoheres. Okay. Now, this kind of thing was, as we said, you know, we would build up, if we looked at this kind of experiment, click by click, as we say, when we moved, as we made delta L, we changed the path length between them. And whether we got a click here or not, we would get, if we did the experiment many, many times, we'd see the same kind of interference fringes for this experiment as we would by looking at the classical experiment. As we all know from, you know, our earliest studies of modern physics, you build up the interference fringes sort of after many, 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 many clicks of the individual quanta. And it was this kind of process that Dirac was referring to in his famous quote in his book where he said, you know, every photon interferes only with itself. Okay? That the, the uh, <laughs> interference that we see is not due to multiple photons, but an individual photon which has, does this path or that path. It's not that two different photons are going through two different paths and they interfere. It's one photon which takes either this path or that path, and we don't know which it is, and therefore we see the interference. And as we all know, that caused tremendous confusion when we think about other kinds of multi-quanta type interference which were not conceived of in the original kinds of interferometers of Michelson and Morley and, and others. When we start thinking about the kinds of interferometers that Hanbury, Brown, and Twist considered, they're just of a different variety. And uh, there are multi-photon type. It's not quite correct to say no photon, or that every uh, interference experiment only occurs with one photon and itself. Um, I'm going to skip around in the way my notes are written here and just talk a little bit for the moment about higher order interference. So for example, um, if we looked at the Henbury, Brown, and Twist experiment, then instead of looking at a whether or not I get a click or not, I look at coincidence. So in the Hamburg Brown twist experiment to measure the correlation time of an electromagnetic field, the idea was the following. Instead of having 
one detector, we have two. Symmetrically oriented, the same exact distance from the beam splitter. 50-50 beam splitter. The light is it hinges upon this beam splitter and can go this way or that. And I might get a click here, and I might get a click here. And what we do is we correlate them. We say, let's look at the, we'll time delay one of these guys, and we'll open up a gate and look for coincidence. Okay? This kind of uh, experiment involves two photons opposed to this experiment, which involves one photon at a time. This involves pairs of photons within some time interval. And there are now interference, what coherence means here is interference of histories. So what are the two possible <coughs> histories that can lead to this. Well, this is an example of two different histories for this kind of the process that gives me a click here. Here, the histories are the following. Either I had a situation where one photon went through the beam splitter and the other photon bounced off the beam splitter, separated by a time tau, and then hit this beam splitter hit that detector, hit that detector, and then, you know, coincidence. That's process one, or process A, or history A. And another history, in another history, um, the, uh, I could have the, the opposite situation, where this guy went through, and then this guy is delayed, and then hits the detector. I'm separating them in space, you can see them, but they're really supposed to be on top of one another. Okay? And this guy is separated by tau, and then hits this with tau. Coincidence. Right? Now, of course, if these two photons are separated in time too much, such that they don't have temporal coherence relative to one another, then these two histories are distinguishable. But if they're kind of within the same wave packet, you don't know where they are within that wave packet, then you can't tell. And therefore, I, have to see, I see interference between these two kinds of processes. And this was an, this was an, an example of non-classical interference. However, the, the story of classical versus non-classical is a little bit tricky. I'll come back to that at the end of the lecture. Um, right. So um, what do I want to say further about this? Well, in order to treat these kinds of processes and talk about the, the, particularly the quantum coherence in the field, we needed to remind ourselves about the quantum nature of the field and the quantization of the field. Maybe I'll write that a little bit over here. As we discussed, um, we if we talked about something like the electromagnetic field or the electric field, we express the quantized electric field in terms of a sum of all of its positive frequency components and its negative frequency components. Okay. Where this, well, where the, if we had periodic boundary conditions. 
in three-dimensional space, then we were, we were able to write a positive frequency component as the sum over a set of plane wave modes on a torus in three dimensions. So we have something having to do with the energy density in the quantization volume. And then we had the plane wave mode, which has some polarization, either the I k dot r minus omega kt. This is the free field times an annihilation operator for that mode. And E minus is the Hermitian conjugate, which involves the creation operators. We have different descriptions as of the quantum field. A dagger or A creates or annihilates a quantum. i.e. a photon in the plane wave mode So one picture, of course, that we have of our field is what, in the jargon, we often call discrete variables. The ends can be 0, 1, 2 discrete numbers, okay, integers. And this is, of course, integrally related to the picture, the degrees of freedom associated with the field that we think about as the particles. So there are particle-like degrees of freedom associated with the electromagnetic field. Okay. Now, uh, there is also a picture that we introduced some, but that we will go into much greater detail in the beginning part of this semester, having to do with the wave degrees of freedom. And what I mean by this, and this is where I think things become confusing, is I'm talking about the quantum waves. And these are what we call the continuous variables. 
about a single mode for a moment, a particular mode. And I'm going to leave off this label and just say there's a, a creation or annihilation operator A for that mode. Okay? As we discussed last semester, this operator A is the quantized complex amplitude. Alpha. So when we think about a classical simple harmonic oscillator, once we put it in some kind of dimensionless variables, then the position of the oscillator as a function of time can be written as the real part of a complex amplitude due to the I omega t. Okay? So, uh, if, if we write A as having some amplitude and phase, then this is equal to A cos omega t minus phi. Right. Uh, which is equal to A cos phi cos omega t plus a sine phi sine omega t, where this is the position at time equals zero, and this is the momentum at time equals zero. Okay. Now, actually, we I should say we typically write this with a square root of two for reasons that will become clear in a moment. So I'll put all my square roots of twos back here. And this is square root of two. Damn square root of two. Um, right. Uh, so the, our picture of our, our classical simple harmonic oscillator involves a phaser, which is the same thing as phase space, uh, where x is the real is the square root of 2, the real part of alpha, and p is square root of 2, the imaginary part of alpha. So the alpha is x plus ip over root 2. And our simple harmonic oscillator is described by a phaser that's going around. If this is the initial guy, then this is it moves counterclockwise. Which is why it's even the minus i. So alpha is a continuous variable in classical physics. In quantum physics, as we said, there are these things that we call the coherent states. So quantumly, A is x plus ip, where x and p satisfy the canonical commutation relation. And that square root of 2 is chosen so that this is 1 if that's i. <laughs> Otherwise, we've got to have the commutator where x and p is 2i. So pick your poison, put your two anywhere. We'll put it here. The root two is here. So this is one, and that's equal to i. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so in addition to Fox states, which are the eigenstates of the number operator, we have coherent states. The coherent states are eigenstates of the annihilation operator. Okay? And they are the quasi-classical states. Why? Well, because these states are the states such that if I start in some coherent state at some time t, my time evolved state, if, time, if the state at time zero is alpha, the state at time t is equal to alpha e to the minus i omega t. So it's a state whose complex amplitude follows exactly the same trajectory as the classical amplitude. Moreover, the expected value of x is just what we had before. It's the square root of 2 times the real part of alpha. And the expected value of t is the imaginary part of alpha. And so if the thing is, if I look at what this expectation value is as a function of time, that expectation value follows exactly the classical trajectory. Moreover, the quantum uncertainty is the minimum. For a coherent state, delta x equals delta p. They're both equal. They're both equal to 1 over root 2, such that the product of them is a minimum uncertainty product. H bar is 1 in these units. And not only is the minimum uncertainty, but they're equal. So what we have discussed is that the coherent state can be understood on this phase plane as a phaser with a little quantum fuzzball around here. So there's a little wave packet, which if I looked at it on the x-axis is going back and forth. It's a Gaussian wave packet that goes back and forth. On the p-axis, it goes back and forth harmonically. It doesn't spread. It doesn't do anything. It stays coherent. Hence the name. Right. Okay. So these kinds of states, these kinds of degrees of freedom, are what we call the uh, continuous variables, where we where we don't specify the state of the field by how many photons are in the field or what's uh, path that particular photon is in, but something about what the wave amplitude is as a complex number and what its quantum uncertainty is. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the next few weeks discussing that. What else shall we say? Oh yeah, I guess there's one connection between the discrete variables and the uh, continuous variables that I want to make, and that's the business about number phase uncertainty. So one thing we sort of mentioned a little bit offhand, and maybe we'll get into in some more detail this semester, is the notion of phase of the quantum wave. 
So, you know, classically, what we, you know, we have our quantum phaser that has an amplitude and a phase, right? And the amplitude is the square root of the complex number squared. Quantumly, quantum should be able to be made into an adverb. Uh, we said A goes to, or alpha goes to the annihilation operator, right? And therefore, uh, the amplitude of the wave is like the square root of A dagger A. That's a perfectly good permission operator. This is the square root of the number operator. And um, can be expressed in terms of the number basis because the number operator itself is diagonal in the number basis, so, so is the, any function of it. So that is what we mean by the square root of the number operator. Okay? Now, what would we mean by the phase? Well, typically something that's like a phase is like either the i times real number. So quantumly, you might think this is the e to the i times the Hermitian operator, which is a unitary operator. But there's a little bit of a snafu here because of the fact that we're talking about infinite dimensions and unbounded operators and all kinds of mathematics that's a little bit nasty and hairy. But we can write down a few things. So, we know that the action of, say, A on N is the square root of N times N minus 1, right? So there's two things that A has to do. It has to do a lowering operator, and then it has to put out front this square root of N. Well, that's fine. We see where that comes from. So we can write the annihilation operator, which is the quantum analog of the uh, complex amplitude, as first act with the square root of the number operator. And then this thing I'm going to call the phase operator. And we see what the action of that, well, it's not really the phase operator, it's e to the i phase thing. I'm not actually separating it out. And what is that? e to the i and phase e is the thing that's going to take n plus 1 down to n. Okay? And that, when I uh, first operate with the square root of n on the number, oper on the, a number state, I'll pull out the square root of n, and then I'll lower. I'll take whatever is n plus 1 and move it down to n. That's fine. And a dagger is the other way around. It's first do the dagger of that, which is take n plus 1 or take n up to n plus 1. And then when you apply the square root of n to that, I'm going to get the square root of n plus 1 on the risen operator, right? Because first I'll raise it, and then when the square root of n hits it, it'll get the square root of n plus 1. So that works. So it looks good. Why isn't this unitary? Well, this is not actually equal to the, it, it's not actually, if I multiply these two things, 
That's not the same thing as doing it in the other order. And a unitary operator has to satisfy that. The problem is that I can't lower beyond the vacuum. So this is, although it maps an orthogonal state to an orthogonal state, technically, this is not a unitary operator. It's what's called a partial isometry. Um, and so there is no phase operator, but nonetheless, there's something we call the phase variable. We'll talk more about this later. But the point I really wanted to emphasize here is that from this, as we showed last semester, the following holds. There's a phase number uncertainty relation. We'll derive it, hopefully, more precisely. But loosely speaking, the following is true. Delta n, delta phi is about bigger than, always bigger than 1. Which means that a Fox state, which has no uncertainty in number is completely uncertain in phase. And what we would call a phase eigenstate, or a phase state, as we'll discuss, has completely uncertain number. So if we want to create something like a coherent state, which has some kind of phase, then we know that state is not a state with a definite photon number. In fact, we showed that for a coherent state itself is a superposition of number states with probability amplitudes given by alpha to the n over squared of n factorial e to the minus alpha squared over 2 such that the probability of seeing n photons is alpha squared, I'm sorry, which is equal to probably amplitude squared, is equal to alpha squared to the power n e to the minus alpha squared over n factorial. Which we recognize as a Poisson distribution. This is equal to the mean number to the power n e to the amount in n factorial, where the mean number of photons in the coherent state is the classical intensity, the square of the amplitude. But there are fluctuations fluctuations, the variance in the photon number is equal to the mean. That's what's true for a Poisson distribution. And this was an example of what we call photon statistics. That even if we had a state that had a perfectly well-defined intensity, which is to say it has a, it's an eigenstate of the annihilation operator with eigenvalue alpha. That state can't have a definite number of photons because it has a well-defined phase. And the fluctuation photon number is uh, always there, no matter how far you attenuate that laser. So if you attenuate a laser to extremely low levels, alpha could be tiny, the mean number of photons is very small, but there will always be fluctuations. You can't that
not equivalent to a single photon state. Making a single photon state is a challenge. And we're going to talk about that some in this course. All right. Paul, it quits for that. Anybody have any questions? All right, so again, as always, please feel free and do interrupt me because, you know, I'll just rattle on and uh, it's important as we, as we move forward that we drop this meeting. All right? Different from the sort of particle by particle thing. Uh, in fact, this marriage between understanding multi quanta coherent phenomena and entanglement. Of course, when we talk about multi-quanta, it's another word for many-body, right? Uh, many-body physics has now, uh, is now beginning to be more deeply analyzed from the perspective of its uh, entanglement properties and how that relates to things like the order parameter uh, of uh, a condensed matter system. So there is, there are relations. Some of the kinds of things like Hanbury Brown twists that we talked about and we'll review again today are being uh, revisited in the context of more traditional uh, condensed matter physics. Um, right now. Of course, once we start thinking about this kind of uh, many-body or multi-quanta type quantum coherent phenomena entanglement, then, well, as we all know, such systems tend to be uh, fairly delicate. And it's quite difficult to uh, have systems that can exhibit multi-quanta or many-body quantum coherent phenomena beyond sort of a few degrees of freedom. And the physical quantities that are effectively waves that are described within the classical description, the electromagnetic waves. And then at the same time, we're talking about the interference at the quantum level. Things get a little bit confusing here. Well, what are the processes? Are the waves that we're talking about that represent those processes in the quantum world the same thing as those classical waves, those cl classical electromagnetic waves? And that was one of the subjects that we addressed to some degree last semester. In particular, uh, if we're talking about um, Uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, processes, there is a direct analogy, of course, we have the problem of those, those processes are typically associated with quanta or particles. So there is an important aspect of this which has to do with wave-particle duality. Um, now, things, there were interference is a natural um, consequence of linearity, meaning that if we have that because waves are solutions to linear differential equations, we have the principle of superposition. 
that if we have any two solutions to a wave equation, then their linear combination is also a solution. And because of that, we have the, the property of interference. Okay? Now, of course, when we go into the Thong domain, then what we're talking about when we talk about quantum coherence is not necessarily the interference between physical waves, but we're talking about interference of processes. It's a much more abstract notion of interference. And of course, there is a way in which, because there is, when we're talking about quantum optics, and because there are aspects of this kind of interference of processes which have a direct classical analogy in terms of what we would think about as classical wave interference. And there were aspects of that kind of interference which had no classical analog whatsoever. And in particular, when we thought about multi-quanta processes, then we typically have typically no classical analog. So the things get really interesting for us when we're not thinking about the interference kind of photon by photon, or one individual photon, but when we had collections of multiple photons that whose collective behavior was kind of irreducibly collective and couldn't be taken particle by particle. And that will lead us to something we're going to talk in much more detail this semester, which we only kind of cursorily discussed last semester. And that's the important subject of entanglement. That's something we really, it's not a word we really used very much last semester, but we'll use a lot more this semester as we try to really develop more un deeper understanding about how multi-quanta coherent phenomena are different. So let us begin. And today what we'll do is just review and you know kind of get our minds back wrapped around what we had been thinking about last semester and to talk a little bit about where we're headed this semester, what some of the goals are for the semester. So as we have discussed many times now, the subject of quantum optics is really at its heart about coherence. And what we mean by co what I mean by coherence is a system is exhibits coherence means that uh, Coherence if it has the capacity to exhibit interference. Now, of course, interference is a notion that comes from classical physics. And what we mean when we talk about interference we typically are talking about waves, All right? That's where the notion of interference comes from. Uh, and in classical physics, wave interference 